Today on the channel, we're going to do an interview with Eddie Ojeda from Twisted Sister. That's me. Thanks for reminding me who I am. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, as I said earlier, we're going to talk to Eddie Ojeda from Twisted Sister. And uh, it was nice enough to have him come over to the house today and have a conversation. So, first of all, man, thank you for coming over today. My pleasure. My pleasure. After this interview, we're also going to take a look at some, a couple of Eddie's uh, classic guitars. We're going to have a little bit of a surprise guitar showing and uh, probably jam a little bit. So, looking forward to that. Yeah, it's be definitely. Great. All right, man. So first and foremost, I want to let you know uh, we've been, of course, we've been talking now for like two hours before this interview. So um, <laughs> some of this can be covered. Really, everything we've covered everything. <laughs> so now we're going to try to get the magic on camera, right? But uh, I've told. To go in the phone, right? I, I know we should have just filmed the whole thing, right, from when you pulled into the driveway. Too late. Now. Okay, bye. And then the dogs were barking, and, <laughs> right. and we had to deal with that. Um, okay, so. Uh, when I was when I was around 14, 15 years old, I, I fell in love with Twisted Sister like most uh, young teenagers at that time. MTV, uh, MTV was was wonderful, giving you your band and many other bands a platform uh, to be seen across the entire yep. country. I mean, cable television was invented, and MTV was fantastic for you guys and your image. You guys just exploded. Um, it was and, a good thing. At yeah. That time. <clears throat> MTV. And it was uh, my first experience, first concert ever was seeing Twisted Sister at Broome County Arena in Binghamton, New York. Uh, and it changed my life. You guys were responsible for me wanting to play guitar and follow and pursue music. So. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and I mean that. It, it was, you guys annihilated broom county arena and i've seen the documentary i've watched it you know years ago and i have followed the band throughout um you know throughout my life and i know you guys were a band for many years most of us you know when we first saw we're not going to take it we thought wow who's this new, new band, band right yeah. but you guys as we'll we'll talk about in a moment you guys were a band and grinding for 10 years in yeah. Yeah, a decade right yeah, yeah it just doesn't happen overnight no nope. Not for most people, but for some people, but not, not for us. Yeah. yeah. At that time, we were playing a lot. So, you know, when you're playing all the time, you're really in, the band was really tight. So, you know, and it showed. It was really, when, that's the good thing about doing a lot of shows. Yeah. You know. You get to, you get to hone your sound as a band. Right. and you're just really comfortable on stage. You know, and, uh, and, you know, tight. Everybody really knows they're, what they're doing. Yeah. Instead of like, you know, playing once in a while. It's a lot different than getting a part down in your bedroom. And then when Definitely. you play on a, when you have to deal with a bad sound system or learn how to dial in your amp yeah. sound and what to do when maybe something doesn't go right with, the, like maybe the drummer gets off beat or maybe someone's yeah. not feeling good. You know, you have to. Well, you got to play anyway. You got to play anyway, right. So it's the way it is. You know, if, um, if you're sick, it doesn't matter. You got to. When you're on tour, you gotta play. Yeah. Do you feel like your songs, um, they take a new life also when you play them live? Do you? Yeah, uh, I, I always think, like, we, we do a sound check. I remember doing sound checks. And when the band does a sound check, they're not, they don't play the same way that they play when they're, there's an audience. It's like a whole different thing. I would say, why bother doing a sound check? Because when we come out to play, everybody turns the volume up and plays harder, you know. Right. So, like oh, it's a waste of time because sound check is always like relaxed and comfortable and everybody, nobody's really putting out but once there's an audience everybody's you know lit yeah it's true the audience brings out the best yeah you're going to play a lot time. harder more intensely you know even subconsciously people just they don't realize they do that yep very true yeah I caught on to it like after a while I was saying because I remember the sound check being good and then all of a sudden it was like, what happened? Everything sounds so much louder now, yeah. you know, so. It's also, I mean, if you don't have a really good crowd, I mean, 
Sometimes it happens. Sometimes the crowd just seems a little bit flat, and you have to get them into it because it, the band will give back what the crowd gives sometimes. Oh, yeah. But no matter what, as a professional, you still got to give 100%, even if the crowd... Yeah. I'm sure you guys didn't have that problem. But. No, because Steve was really good at uh, you know, getting the crowd going. And he would, you know, he'd always pick on somebody if they weren't into it. So He'd force you to get into it, yeah, right? Sometimes it was like a little too much, but, you know. <laughs> I know. He'd embarrass people until like get into a fight, yeah. maybe. <laughs> you know, especially some guys he would just pick on people a little too much sometimes. So uh, now that we talked a little bit about, we'll come back to Twisted Sister. I want to talk more about this, but let's let's talk about you. Um, so you you told me earlier that you're Hispanic, Spanish. Yeah, right? Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican. Well, Puerto Rican, and my my grandparents were from Spain, and they kind of migrated. And uh, that's that's what happened. A lot of there was a lot of migration back then from yeah. from Spain to Puerto Rico, and uh, you know. But my parents were raised in born and raised in Puerto Rico. Okay. Yeah. And you were you were born in uh, New York in City. New York City. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So they were they were raised and born and raised in Puerto Rico. When did they come to the United States? Um, you know, very early. Not to date, sometimes, not to date anything. I don't, I don't know. 1910? <laughs> I think in the 60s. The 60s. Like, no, probably, no, probably in the 50s. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, a lot of, there was a lot of migration from Puerto Rico. There's, there's yeah. a lot of Puerto Ricans in New York City. Right, right. You know, so, basically, got people that are born in New York City, they call them New Yorkans. New Yorkans. New Yorkans. New Yorkans. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a Span My last name is a Spanish name. It's Ojeda in Spanish. Ojeda. Ojeda. Yeah. Okay. So I've been saying it wrong my whole life. No. Well, it's I don't expect people to know how to say it. So right. Ojeda sounds better than people. Sometimes they do the, the J like an H, yeah. like Jose. You know. So they yeah. go Ojeda. But I like the way Ojeda sounds better than Ojeda. You know. Yeah. So that that, that happens a lot. Like. If I my phone will say pronounce my name Ojeda, like the J, like a H, J, like Jose. Yeah. Nobody says Jose. <laughs> right. <laughs> Some people say Jesus, not Jesus, right? Right, so? Jesus. Yeah, my father's <laughs> name was Jesus. Was it? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Jesus. At first, I was like, "Wow, you, you have the same name." <laughs> <laughs> He's popular. <laughs> um, so. So, a uh, young Eddie Ojeda in New York City, yeah. what age did you start playing guitar? Um, like 15. 15. What 15. made you start playing, man? What, what was well, it? It's kind of, it's a lot of people, it's very kind of cliche, but the Beatles and the Stones, you know, when they, with that whole English invasion. Right. You know, they came, uh, you know, you saw them, saw the Beatles on TV. Yeah. I don't know, it was just something about it. Right. That said... You know, I told my parents, man, that's, I want to do that. Yeah. It looks like what I want to do for, for a living. Kind of like when I saw Twisted Sister when I was 14. Yeah. And, you know? And yeah. I, I mean, ironically, I mean, I'm, I'm a little younger than you. Not much, a little bit. But um, my brothers and sisters are, um, they were in high school in the 60s. And I, I inherited their Beatles records and Beach Boys. And, Beach Boys, yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. And all that stuff. So I, uh, Beatles were a huge influence on me as well. And yeah, you know, they still continue to influence people. This and the Stones. Yeah. I mean, there's no denying. Uh, there's no denying it. No. What they did and, and the way they make you feel and. There was a whole th thing of bands, not just in, you know English bands, but a lot of American bands, like you said, mentioned the Beach Boys. Yeah, there was a whole thing of. Guys would play guitar and yeah. you know bands instead of just solo artists. You know, I think in the fifties they had the doo wop bands and stuff, but you know a lot of the pop music or popular music there were a lot of solo artists. You know, just singers. Right. And then people like the Beatles and the Beach Boys and the Stones. You know, they came out with their own original music. They weren't. They didn't have writers. They were writing their own music. Yep. And that started that whole trend, I think. Then you had all the youngest bands, like, then later on, Cream, Zeppelin. Yeah. You know, uh, that was a, especially Cream was a big influence. Hendrix, you know. When you were in high school, 
and I, I can say when I was in high school, and you mm-hmm. know, in, in our generation, uh, you know, your generation, my generation, kind of blended together. A lot of us wanted to be guitar players. Uh, nowadays, you know, there are people that want to play guitar, but in our day, it was. It seems like everybody was in. A lot of your friends were in bands, right? Yeah. Did you did you feel like the the competition, like having buddies in bands and other bands at rivalry? It was was it healthy and and did that did that help you to try to drive to be better? Were you trying to like kind of like a one upmanship and competition, or just trying to be better and, and make yourself better? Did that play a part yeah, in your? There, luckily, career? there wasn't a lot of competition as far as. Guys like me that wanted to play guitar and let their hair grow, the whole thing. Yeah. In fact, where I, my neighborhood, there was a lot of guys that were jocks and stuff. Okay. And, you know, it was just me and this guy named Adrian that was, you know, we were friends. He went to music and art high school and, you know, he's somebody who was, he played sax, he was a great artist. I showed him a few chords and, like, in, you know, in six months, he was, like, really playing. Yeah. Like, out playing in bands and stuff. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't that much competition. There was a band, but there were bands around. They were they were playing the high schools and stuff like that. Okay. There was a band called uh, the Four, Fernando and the Four Aces, Fernando and the Four Aces, or something like that. And uh, they were one of the first bands I saw. They were doing all the venture stuff with the mm-hmm. Fender amps and the reverb, and it sounded so amazing. The first time I heard you yeah. know, reverb, I was like, wow, that's <laughs> that's a great sound. And you know, with this with the Fender, uh, ja- I think he was using a Jaguar, yeah, Fender yeah. Jaguar at the time, or a Jazzmaster. And you know, these guys were like five years older, five, six years older than us. And uh, you know, the Beatles, they were kind of, you know, jumping onto that whole thing. And they, right. they looked really cool. I mean, these guys, he kind of looked up to them, you know, so. And I started hanging out with people like that, you know. And, what, you know was your, what was your first guitar? An amplifier, a Kent, a Kent guitar and a Univox amp. Okay, so did you? Um, I when I my first guitar was a Hondo, and I had a, a Yamaha, like a big tall Yamaha. It was like a fake Fender amp twin. It was a big Yamaha amp, right? It was like it was about three feet tall with a Hondo Les Paul, then a, a Hondo Strat, and they were they were kind of junk. But I finally bothered my my yeah. mom enough to buy me a, a really nice guitar. Did you wind up? Progressing? Did you follow a yeah, similar like? Yeah. Well, your, your parents finally, or did you buy one yourself? Work or? Did well, you, the first guitar like, I bought with Christmas money was like forty bucks. It was, you know, the Japanese guitars. The Kent was, and it was a, you know, it was a good guitar to start out on, but you know, it was a cheap guitar. And and the Univox amp, you know, I got that was like Christmas money. I think it was forty bucks for the yeah. guitar. I think <laughs> the amp was another forty dollars. You know. So when did you graduate to like a more professional model? Yeah. What happened there? Tell me about well, that. I, I, paid, I paid for it. I you did. I saved up money. You know, I wanted to get serious. You know, and I worked in a hospital. I was an orderly for the, the X-ray department <laughs> at St. Clair's Hospital. So I saved up enough money, and I bought my first uh, my first serious guitar. It was a Gibson ES three forty five. ES-345, cool. What yes, kind of amp do you remember? Say, I bought a twin reverb. A twin reverb. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. And my father got mad at me because, like, I said, it's my money, man. You know, <laughs> I, I said, well, you didn't pay for it. I paid for it. Because I told him I, I paid $360 for the guitar for Gibson, yeah. you know. And then I think the twin reverb was another 250 or yeah. $250 for it. And, I mean, that was a loud amp. And it was... You know, it was right. It was that amp. It was just I used to take it everywhere with me. It shows how impactful that moment was for you, because yeah, you know, it was a long time ago, and you remember. I remember the first guitar and the second guitar, and I remember all the guitars I bought in amps, like because yeah. you have an emotional connection. With I still it. have the guitar. You still have it. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you still had it. I, for some reason, I took it apart. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's in pieces. It's just not. Yeah, it's all in one thing. Uh-huh. It's all in one case. I decided I found it, and I said, I thought I had thrown it out, and then yeah. I just found it. What year is it? Do t- you know? Oh, this had to be like the '60s. Yeah. You know, so, and I've I've actually seen them for sale on on eBay a couple of years ago. I was tempted to buy one, but I said. You know, let me see if I can get this one to work again. And it's one of those things that well, we need to it, put it back together. Yeah, maybe 
Yeah, I'll we'll do that. Yeah, we'll bring it over and we see what we can do with it. We'll see what, we, what trouble we can get into. That make a good video. Let's little, restore. It was a little, you know. Let's restore Eddie's old Gibson. <laughs> no, it was no. This was a Kent. I was a Kent. Oh, a I thought you. Oh, I thought you said. I'm sorry, man. I thought you said you still had your Gibson, the 345. No, I don't have the 345. I I sold that. Okay. Okay. A mistake. Well, the Kent's cool. We still put that back together. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Gibson I kept for a long time. Yeah. In fact, when I first joined Twisted, I was I still had the Gibson, but it just didn't fit the band, you know. And then we had like a pretty cool deal with this music store in Jersey, New Jersey, called Mascara Music. So, you know, at the time, I think I was able to get an Ibanez. Yeah. For, like an Ibanez Explorer. I started using that. I, I think I paid 150 bucks for it. And it was a good guitar for that kind of money. So was the Ibanez your first, um, like, metal yeah. guitar with Twisted Sister? Yeah, the Ibanez. Destroyer. Okay. And then I had, there was another Ibanez that I was using that was like a uh, less Polish type of guitar. Okay. But I used the, the, the Explorer quite a, quite a bit, mm -hmm. you know. And unfortunately, I refinished it and sold it. And now, like, they're yeah. collective. Well, you know, you know, well, Eddie Van Halen, you know, a lot of the Van Halen stuff was a destroyer. Like, yeah. you really got me and all the non-whammy bar stuff on the early Van Halen albums. And then I believe that's the same guitar he cut out, cut the chunk out of. The Shark was a destroyer body with a Karina wood. Yeah, and, a uh, Karina wood. It was a, it was a yeah, they're very really valuable good guitar, now. man, for the money. It was, those Ibanez guitars were not expensive either, but they were really good. Yeah. Um, as you know, you see the company still around, so Absolutely. they were making real good guitars that you know you could play professionally with. Mm -hmm. And uh, on a budget, I, I, <laughs> I get upset when I think about that. So <laughs> telling that I should have never refinished it in the first place. What? So what? Um, you know, I should know this, but I don't. I could probably give a close date. But what year did Twisted Sisters start? What was your official? Uh, you started without D. Yeah. Like so, officially, you guys. Who, 1975. And who was singing? Who was singing with you guys at the time? It was myself. Uh, JJ was doing the Lou Reed stuff. Okay. You know, like kind of the talk singing. Mm -hmm. And Kenny was the other singer, the bass player. I got you. All right. It was a four piece. We tried doing that, like you know, the Rolling Stones type of vibe. You know, with Capizios. The. the got you. We kind of dressed very Rolling Rolling Stone ish. Uh huh. Kind of that. Way sort of bohemian sort of look and uh did you guys change your image as like the hair yeah. metal scene and kind of evolved yeah it just sort of happened like uh you know we were this, we were thinking about getting a singer because it was kind of hard for us to sing and doing all the playing and singing at the same time and sure so this cta was our, our booking agency uh creative talent they were called and they were booking all different bands in the clubs, in the whole club scene in the, mm -hmm. the tri-state area. So they told us about D. You know, they said this guy named Danny, he was in a band called Peacock, something like that. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Peacock. And, um, and he wasn't happy with the band. And so, you know, he came in try out with us. And he looked like Robert Plant from a distance, you know, like, with the back of the room, he had that kind. Of, he was very into the Robert Plant thing, and we would we started doing all the Zeppelin stuff from Zeppelin One, and it sort of really clicked, like because we loved that album, and you know, I mean, okay. cases break down all those. Right. Every guitar player learned those songs. Sure. I mean, that was that was the thing. So we started doing. We were like a Zeppelin band in the beginning, doing mostly you know Zeppelin One. I think we did every song on that mm -hmm. album, and. He was singing very Robert Planty style, and the hair, he, he had the whole look, he used to wear the little shirts, and um, he sort of decides, you know, he sort of, the band had more worn makeup already, he was after doing that whole Bowie era, so the band was a makeup band, and then when I joined, we didn't do that, we just kind of got dressed up. Yeah, kind of rock and rolly, but not makeup. Well, you know, New York had a lot of that going on in the seventies and early eighties yeah. with like the New York Dolls. Dolls, and right. you know, Kiss obviously was doing some crazy stuff mm -hmm. long before that. Not not your image that you guys came up. You know, right. you you guys had, you guys took it to an original level. Like there were bands like Motley right. and Rat that came out later, and Poison, and they they had their makeup thing going. But you yeah. guys had. 
you guys sort of had the andro- androgynous hair metal thing going on, but you all, it was also right. kind of barbaric. Also. Yeah, we were. Yeah, it was like it's street. It was very street. It was like gorilla Smart. glam. It was gorilla glam. <laughs> gorilla glam. Yeah. Gorilla glam. Yeah. yeah, and and D Fugly. Kind of, and D kind of personified <laughs> that, and and you know obviously the videos. Yeah, and um, Gorilla Glam, that's a good one. Uh, but it was you heard uh, it first, Gorilla Glam. Yeah, it was, it, you know because you know we weren't little guys, you know we were like all you know right, and then with the shoes and everything, and, we, we, you know, and the hair, and the hair. And so, but you know we kind of. Uh, it started off kind of glammy, but then it sort of became more war painty. Yeah. You know, like I started doing the stripe thing with uh, very like Indian, because I kind of, a lot of people think I'm an American, you know, a Native American. Yeah. So I kind of went for that kind of vibe, you know, with the makeup I was wearing. You know, I got out of the whole, it started off very sort of glammy, but it turned into more of like a putting on the war paint kind of vibe, which I liked better. I liked when it went when it transformed into that because it wasn't glammy, because I, you know, that's not really what really fit us. I thought the type of guys we were, um, as it probably looked, it was worked better for guys like Crew, Motley Crew, and mm-hmm. certain bands like uh, Poison. You know, they they did the glam thing a lot better than we did. So yeah. I think the fact that we transitioned more into like a war paint thing. Yeah. Uh, well, your music was aggressive too. Yeah. It, it, it also kind of fit. Right. You, you, you guys didn't sing, uh, you know, not putting down you know, hair metal bands, which I hate that term, but you know, the, the yeah. glam metal bands, the, a lot of them sang about women and, and sex and drugs and, 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 you know, all the, the pitfalls of, you know, rock and roll. And, yeah. But you guys, uh, lyrically, D, you know, D didn't really sing about stuff like that. No. It was. Like burning hell, burn hell is is like yeah, a hard, fan, like stuff hard. like that's killer, man. Yeah, yeah. It's hard as nails. It's pretty deep stuff under the blade, you know. Stay hungry, stay right hungry. off the bat. Stay yeah. hungry, you know. Um, I, yeah, nothing was about you know girls and that kind of thing. So. And you guys didn't even personify that in your concert. It was like we are gonna fight together. <laughs> it's kind of like what I felt like we're in. We're, this is a this is like a battle zone, like. When you saw yeah. when you saw D live back in those days, and you guys, you guys backed him up perfectly. It was yeah. D was the front, but you all meshed together yeah, as one unit, and it was <laughs> and uh, and play, we spoke earlier about playing live. It helps you develop the song and the yeah. image, and that's where and it evolved to that. It just doesn't happen overnight, and yeah. and it takes a lot of hard work and dedication. Of, and when you find that groove. You guys found it, and with MTV, yep. whose idea was was it the label that when you guys were, I mean, Under the Blade was first, and mm-hmm. I don't think you shot really any real video for Under the Blade, right? No, no production for that? No, no. So, um, was it the same label that you were? No, that was the first, well, the album came out with Secret Records, and, they, and our first record deal was in England. A guy from England, and Secret Records, it's a good name for the label, because... You know, secret it was, a, you know, it was a pretty well kept secret. Yeah. Um, but uh, we ended up getting that deal with Atlantic Records, and then they put out uh, after Stay Hungry's success, they said, "Hey, let's put out, let's re redo the uh, first album." Yeah. So then they did Under the Blade. They released Under the Blade after Stay Hungry, but under the original Under the Blade was with Secret Records, which I think that album. If people, it's a, a collector's item now because uh, whoever got it, I think I might. I don't even know if I still have a copy. Because I gave oh, stuff let's away call all the time. D. Let's see. Let's see if D's got it. <laughs> I gave stuff away all the time. You know, sometimes I would, like, I would get stuff and I'd give it to a friend or somebody would ask yeah. me, and I'd say, and then I'd end up realizing I don't have anything. So. So did Atlantic <clears> say, you know, we've got to, we've got to take, we're not going to take it. I want to rock. We're going to take these songs and make them into. The, well, like the spectacle that it became, did they? Was it in? Well, Can't Stop Rock and Roll was the first album we did with Atlantic, and they were into it. Okay. You know, but you know, then they they said, okay, well, this out the next album, we'll really get behind you guys. And Stay Hungry was the album that broke us, you know, and then which which also helped Stay Hungry, the uh, Come On, excuse me, Can't Stop Rock and Roll album got yeah. more, you know, because that album, but. 
Can't Stop Rock and Roll was the first album with Atlantic Records. Yeah, I forgot about that. You... Yeah, and we recorded that in in England. And uh, yeah. And but then, it's kind of like they strapped a jetpack to you guys after that. You know, they just like, yeah. let's just go with it. What was it like? What was it like, man? Um, when the, I, it wasn't overnight, but when the videos hit, did was it? Did you see a significant change yeah. in in mm-hmm. in venues and yeah. and like crowd turnout and what what was that like? I mean, in, in a nutshell, <laughs> How's it, can you explain like what yeah, was that? What that feel like? There was definitely. I mean, those videos made a big difference. I mean, I remember people knowing the whole, all the uh, words to the, the script, you know, they would repeat. I'd be something, I'd be able to do the whole thing. Who yeah. are you? Where do you come from? <laughs> oh, I did this. And I'm like, oh, it was unbelievable. Like, I'd go to somebody's house and their friends and their, their kids or whatever, their brothers and sisters would say, oh man, I saw you guys. And they'd do the whole thing in front of me, yeah. you know. <clears throat> And uh, which was, you know, and I, it's funny because at the time, I didn't have cable TV, so I didn't see any of this, you know. But the, more, a lot of people had cable TV, and they, yeah. I didn't see it till way later and realize how much exposure those yeah. videos had. I didn't have cable either. I had to. I think they showed videos on local television yeah. on Saturday nights for like thirty minutes, but they always played. We're not going to take it. They always played it. Um, yeah. That year, it was like the, probably with the number one requested video for probably six months or so, and then you guys followed up with "I Want to Rock" was second, right? Or was that the first? I want to rock. Take was, no, we're not going to take it. It was the first. Yeah. Then I want to rock was the next. Yeah. Video. And then uh, we talked. We talked earlier about me seeing you guys at Broome County Arena in Binghamton. You guys shot the video for the price, the price yeah. at, in Binghamton. And, and when we talked about it earlier a few days ago, I think you. You were like, did we shoot it there? But I was there, and I know I was. I had forgotten where it was actually, but I remember shooting it that day. It's on YouTube. You can see it. Yeah, the official video. Of course, you know that it's your. It's up on those. I mean, I think the, we're, we're not going to take it up to like 50, 60 million views now. Yeah, it's amazing. And I want to rock is up there too. Yep. Yeah. A lot of views. So how did you get your guitar tones on? I, I, I mean, we talk. Uh, this interview could be like five hours long. I'm such a nerd, such a geek over this stuff. So we I'm trying. Are, to, I'm, I'm trying to jump around. I'm sorry if I'm. We went from like how, when did you start playing guitar right into <laughs> tone is a thing. Everybody right. Every, every week we're searching for a new tone. But your whatever. your sound. Um, first of all, you sent me some audio clips the other day of you playing on this amp, and you have a whammy bar style. Yeah. You have a whammy bar thing, and. You can tell people's style when they play. You can tell Clapton, you can tell Paige, you can tell Beck, you can play, you know, Eddie, whoever. And I could tell it was immediately you. And you played with your whammy bar and you did these riffs. I'm like, that, that's Eddie, right? Yeah. So your sound is also identifiable. But you've got this... Um, Thanks, it's good to On know. Stay Hungry, yeah. it sounds like you were yeah. running... I, I, were you playing like Boogies and Marshalls together, or what were, I, there's, was, were, you, were they blended? It was, was a combination it? of both uh, Boogies and, and Marshall amps. And uh, when we did Stay Hungry, when we did Can't Stop Rock and Roll, <clears throat> I think we were just going straight through Marshalls in England, uh, most of that. Because I don't remember using any pedals. I think we just had Marshalls on 10. The know? production... You hear a lot of old records, and I mean, if it's a good song, it doesn't really matter sometimes the production, but some albums don't age well. Some albums just, the production doesn't sound like they, back in those days it was okay, but do you listen to it yeah. now? But those albums hold up, and you know, and I'll, I'll go back to Stay Hungry just as an example. That album, the drum sound, and the bass, and the guitars, the way they're mixed, and of course Atlantic was behind, there was a big budget on that, yeah. but there's some big budget records that absolutely sound awful. Those those records to me still sound current. They still sound you know they don't need to be remixed or remastered. They're yeah, they, pretty, they're clean. Yeah, it's that's a good thing because like it's funny you say that because I sometimes I listen to some of the old Kiss stuff. Yeah, and, and the guitars sound pretty clean. They don't even sound like heavy. Yeah, and. Uh, but at least our stuff still sounds, you know, the yeah. heaviness is there. You know, 
Well, the tone's not only... I mean, old Marshalls don't sound like the current amps. The no. old Marshalls, you, they have a certain character in their breakup right. that gives clarity, but yeah. they are crunchy, but it, it, it's they fill that spectrum, that mid-range right. spectrum really mm -hmm. well. But yeah. you guys have a dirty sound, but when I also say clean, I mean, it's you can hear everything on those records. Yeah. Um, they they really. Uh, where did you record "Stay Hungry"? Where was that? Was it in New York City? Uh, that was New York and California. Tom Warman was the producer for "Stay Hungry." Did you cut all the guitars in one area, or were they cut? Um, both, both. I I want to rock. I did. The, I know the guitar solo was in California. Okay. At Westlake Studios. Um, so. Half and half. I think most, a lot of the solos I think I did in California. Yeah. And I remember uh, Workman, Jeff Workman was the engineer. He had a lot of cool pedals that you'd bring. Mm -hmm. And he would sort of hook it up. And sometimes it sounded like a Boeing, a Boeing 707. I mean, it was so, <laughs> like it was like, <sighs> you know, in the studio. So I would just put on the headphones and play uh, to that. And, you know, they used some kind of... Uh, noise gate yeah. to stop the noise from the amps yeah. and just get, he was a really good engineer so were they, trying to, were they slaving some amps like through the boogies and running um, the heads together to get different sounds? I, I think at times yeah, work, Jeff Workman did a lot of that stuff with the sounds Yeah. so um, they weren't, I, were they weren't your amps they were studio provided amps? they were studio amps yeah, Yeah. but they were definitely marshals and boogies Yeah. and sometimes I would end up using the boogie amp um or the Marshall, or both, you know. Yeah. I wish I, you know, I, now that I think about it, I th maybe I should have wrote down what we used. And, you know, but we didn't think about you, that stuff when you cut records. You I know? mean, now you have camera, you know, the phones. Right, you, right. You could just videotape everything, take pictures, and it's just. I easy. would love to see if it was around. And at the time, you know, it was like, hey, you know, you just plug into an app, and that was it. You right. Know? And you didn't think that much about it. And if you had a Boost, whatever you used, an Overdrive or a Fuzz Tone, you just did it, you know. Um, there were so many different ones, you know, electroharmonics ones. There was a, yeah. a lot, you know, a lot of different things. I, I mean, he used to he had a lot of good pedals that that he would bring in, and you know, I just kind of let him do his thing. I was just he would get the you know I get the sound and. Was it his idea for you to for him to put the crybaby on the I Want to Rock solo? Um, I think because um, you don't. I mean, Cry Baby's not part of your thing no, like all the time. I, I, that's, and that's not the only song, but you know, right? I, I always have to have a wah wah pedal because of that. You know, right? I mean, I sometimes I know Dee's played with some guys that they don't they don't bother using the wah wah pedal, which I think you have you know, to on I, that I, song. Yeah, you have to, and you know, but I think it was. I think it might have been. I think it might have been Workman's idea to use a yeah. You know, he was, a, he was a good guy to work with. Yeah. And I think he well, said, mess with, the, you know, play with the Wawa. And actually, that, that take I did in, like, it was like, I was practicing, I, you know, because they brought me in to do the solo. And, um, you know, I just said, okay, well, if I'm going to do the solo, and he said, try using the Wawa. So I just jammed out, like, really comfortable. You know, in the first time, sometimes when you think, okay, you're recording, you see the red light, you get a little... But I was just, you know, I didn't know they were recording. Yeah. And they were recording what I was, me just messing around. Yeah. And. No pressure, you just did yeah, it. Yeah, it was like 10 minutes and <laughs> and then all of a sudden he said, that's it. I said, what do you mean? I said, I'm, you know. <laughs> and then I went inside and they said, no, that's it. And I'm like, well, let me get So I went take. inside and I heard it and I said like, wow, that, that does sound pretty. Because it was just yeah. impromptu and very relaxed that's and, awesome to know and it was just one of those solos that yeah. i was just i never i then sat down to write it like i did the the price solo it wasn't a written solo it was a jam and then i had to end up learning it for the you know because i didn't remember what i did i just did it and then you know when we started playing the song live i just had to go back and listen to it and right. learn it it's a tough solo to play. I've played it live before. Yeah, and I'm like, it, I, I, sometimes I, I get it, you know, I improvise it, but I'm like, sometimes it doesn't feel right. It, it, I mean, people get away with improvising it because <laughs> it's kind of like up here in the middle and then on the, on the high. But um, the whole wow thing just works a certain, I don't know, it just worked out really good. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, the wow thing just, you know, ended up working out. 
on that song. One thing I, I want to talk to you about uh, is uh, you harmonize. You do a lot of harmony um, in your solos. A lot of mm -hmm. Was yeah. that all you, or did JJ harmonize yeah. with you on the studio and had to no, do that I, live? I did everything in the studio. Like yeah. That. yeah. What inspired you to, to do harmonies? I mean, was it, it was it the producer? Was it something you're like, did I hear a harmony to make it sound fatter? Well, but I, I kind of like the Brian May Queen thing that he did. You know, like, because yeah. he would take a simple melody, but then when you do the harmonies to it, and Iron Maiden too. Yeah, I was like, going to say A lot Maiden. of their licks are just... If you took the lick by itself, it's just down, 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 down. It's, a, it's not like a real hard lick to play, but once you add a harmony to it, it, be, it just comes alive. So right. you don't want to play something too busy and harmonize. I mean, so, I have some bands do that, but it, you know, it just kind of gets too crazy. But um, like, you know, Queen, uh, Brian May did all those things, and I made them as well. So I always kind of liked that, and that's what I wanted. That's why I kept the solo solo and we're not going to take it and I, I kept it real simple I just kind of did a melody solo because the second half comes in with harmonies right but they never mixed the harmony parts loud enough I mean I you, you could hear them but I wanted it to be more like real up front like a queen or Iron Maiden thing that's why I kept that solo so simple and then and you know because it was a single they wanted to keep the solo short so I kept it short and simple but then when we redid the album, when we did the Still Hungry album, I did a long version, which I play live, you know, the, a longer version of the solo, mm -hmm. which is more like a uh, you know, harmonic minor kind of cool. solo that I do, the, like a relative minor solo, kind of. I always mess up that you were not going to take it solo. I've got a, I play in a little metal really? cover band, and it's easy, it's e I mean, it's, it's easy, easy to play, it's not yeah. easy, but I always, I, I, I want you to show me later where you play it. I want to know like the position you're in because I think if I could visual, it's the position I'm in that I can't visualize the wow. shape. Yeah. I play it on the in the E bar chord shape up here. I play it up there. Do you yeah. play it up on the 12th fret or do you play it? No, I play it on the, yeah. That, the you B, play it the like B the B ninth? Area. Like, e, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. I don't know why I just, I, I always just like, I, I choke on it, man. So it's gotta be just right. But. No, it's a, you know, <laughs> it's a sim I mean, it's a, I know like sometimes a lot of people tell me that's the first solo they ever learned, like Smoke on the Water, Yeah. you know. And you know, there's a good and bad side to that because it's like so simple that, you know, a beginner can play it. So, you know, sometimes I've yeah. gotten crap about, you know, I hear somebody saying, oh, my mother could play that riff. You know, it wasn't about, you know, it's, it was a song. You know, if you're a song yeah. guy, you do what's right Who for the song. Who says guitar playing has to be athletic? There's a time and place for it, right? Yeah, and that wasn't it. You know, I mean, I Want to Rock was the right song. It was for that kind of song. Right, right, right. You know, like a jam out thing. But we we're not going to take it was a very, you know, themed song. So I just kind of kept with the theme. and uh, It wouldn't be right if, it, like, if that was a, a different solo in that song. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be right. Did you take any alternate versions of it, or was that the no? Set well, I ended up doing a long version, and I still do the but I only do the thing at the end uh -huh. in harmony. But I do the whole intro now. That it's a, a bit like a, you know, like a jam out solo, uh, more of a riffy thing. The guitars that you played live, did you use those in the studio, or did you have different guitars in the studio? No, I played the same ones. Okay. Yeah. I know some guys are like, well, you know, for the studio, I'm going to use this whatever but not bring it on the road but you your road guitars were your studio yeah, guitars yeah yeah that's you know, cool i mean they weren't like old vintage guitars they were like the charvels you know the, the bullseye was a that was the first bullseye ever made you know and you brought the bullseye with you today right yeah yeah which we're, we're gonna look at yeah. in a second video we're gonna look at eddie's guitars which is gonna be awesome yeah, um, this is the second bullseye that, but also you know wayne charvel made it for me I noticed in, uh, I was looking at one of your videos the other day, um, there's, that thing's seen some road wear. That thing, it's... Uh, well, I have one that's really seen a lot. Yeah. I didn't bring that one. Okay. That's for another day. But. <laughs> that's for another day. Yeah. To be continued. <laughs> yeah, that has like a, a maple neck. Yeah, this is like a Charvel, Charvel. It's made, it's Wayne, it says Wayne, because... Uh, it says Wayne, sold, yeah, Wayne? Well, he yeah. sold the, the company, so... When he went back to making guitars again, and you know he made it exactly like the first one, except this one actually had 22 frets. The first one only had 21 frets, so it was an improvement. And then I have a Sustainiac pickup in the neck 
position, which I didn't have on the original. Yeah. So this had 22 frets and sustain the act. And, you know, it was a lot more, like on Burning Hell, I could do the, yeah. the notes longer. And, Man, I, I just bought a Schecter with a Sustainiac. Those are it's great. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, I had to have one. I played one a few weeks ago, and I, 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 I was like, I need yeah. the Sustainiac. They're so cool. Yeah, there's no sweet spot. You can just play anywhere. You hit that switch, and then, and right. then especially with the three octaves, you know. Yeah. I used to, so on Burning Hell, I used to do that. You know, right? Sometimes I used to have to find the right spot to get the feedback. Yeah, right. And sometimes it would just die on me. And I would like, or it would I'd, go higher too quick. Or yeah, or I'd have to keep hitting it, and then that kind of slain. <laughs> you know? Right. Then they're like, come on, sustain. <laughs> it's like, uh, so with, once I got that, it was like, I could be anywhere on the stage, and it'll stay there forever. And then I hit the oct high octave, and then I just give it a little bit right. with the whammy bar and go. And then I would hear like, they put a little echo on it. And, and I would end it, you hear what, what trips me out about the Sustainiac pickups is if you're playing it acoustically, like mm -hmm. you turn your amp off and your cord's still plugged in it, they oh, still yeah. work. Still, so you yeah. can be you can be plunking away and sustaining yeah, it. You can, feel, you can feel the strings vibrate. It's like the guitar. Like, like Ebo used to do that. Right. Yeah, but now it's be, it's easier with the pickup, you know. Yeah. I mean, you have to control it. It can get out of hand if you don't. I know. Certain people... You wouldn't. You don't want the music sustained. I know, and you know we do. We I talk about a lot about Van Halen on this channel, and I never say anything. You know, Eddie, Eddie Van Halen is uh, no no denying Eddie's awesome. Um, he changed the whole right. Thing, Eddie man. Eddie changed everything, and you know he uh, Charvel. He he helped Charvel launch the crew. Yeah, I mean he, that's all Eddie, right? But Eddie uses Sustainiac a lot on the the three era, the Van Halen three era in the late nineties, and he had one in his, his first Wolfgangs, and I have poor memories. For years, I, I didn't want to get a Sustainiac because, like you said, you don't want to put the Sustainiac in the hands of the wrong person. Not that Eddie was the wrong person, but I didn't use a Sustainiac for years because I just wasn't a fan of... Um, help. <laughs> I just I, I was like, Eddie, don't play the Sustainiac. Feedback help. Yeah, yeah I, I felt like it was kind of like a crutch. And some people could probably use it. But no, but it's controlled feedback. If it you know, really it's is. It's actually not that easy. to. You have to you know, be careful with it because it can get out, of hand, get yeah. out of control easily. And you could overdo it. It's yeah. something you could really just overuse. But I can't wait to record with it. But sometimes it's just great. If you know how to you know, keep it from... Because sometimes... If you let the other strings ring out, they'll all vibrate. And, yeah, know, they can get can get pretty out of control if you don't know how to mute it with your hand right. So it's it's a whole technique involved. It's not that it's not that easy. I always wondered how Steve Vai played. There's a song Steve has. It's called "Whispering a Prayer," and Steve, it's a delicate, melodic, beautiful song. It's it's Irish sounding, and and it almost sounds like he's playing a flute in it, and he's. When he does it live, I never, I, I never registered. Like, how is he getting his guitar? To, he must be standing in front of the monitor a certain way because you said you used to, had to do it yeah. back in the day that way, and and it's Staniac. So yeah, that's uh, that's the thing because if you don't have you're not in the right spot and you, and you can't get that certain feedback, yeah. and you can be anywhere with the Staniac. Yeah, it's and, great, and as long as you know you keep keep it under control, and you know Neil Sean uses it, and sometimes. It's just good when you don't want to get like a, a ping or a certain thing and you put it on that right. high octave. Right. And you get that, that little, that high. Right. Um, you know, that high octave uh, right. ping, that, you know, that squeal that uh, it's kind of hard to get without it. In fact, on um, the Come Out and Play album, there's a song called King of the Fools. I did the whole solo on that. It's all, I don't know if you ever hear it, but. I used an Ebo and I did three guitar parts on it. And it's a do, 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 do. I do this whole thing. And I did it with an Ebo on one st thing on one string. And it was that's cool. it was really hard to do with an Ebo. Uh -huh. So yeah. that's before I they I didn't know that about the system. They weren't the, I don't think that's why they ever caught on. They were a little hard to use. It was Yeah, they were very hard to use. You really get to do it live. Because live you have to really stand still, you have to be right over the, yeah, they were clunky. the string. You know, you have to really, and you can really only, you know, to try to move strings, it's actually, you have to, you know, it's, it was really right. difficult. Right, right. So, but that was before I got the Sustainiac. I used the Nebo on that song. And that was my idea. I told, and D Dieter Dirks produced that album. And, you know, he loved it when I, I did it. But 
I really like the way that came. It's one of those songs that didn't get much airplay, but I really liked the, the way that, that whole guitar part came out. Yeah, I know we've been talking a lot about gear and songs, and you know we'll we'll wrap this up here quick, but um, yeah. and do some other things. But you told me the other day that as far as technology is concerned, you're you're playing through a Kemper right now. So you've embraced yeah. you've yeah. embraced the Kemper. I know you still have some old tube amps, and you like yeah. you like amps. You're not you're always yeah. gonna love amps, right? Sure. Twin. I mean, yeah. But you've tube embraced amps, it. You've embraced the Marshall technology. And Fender, you know, I still love them. The boogies too, but. More of a Marshall Fender guy, you know. But, uh, but you find the Kemper is, do you the use it Kemper's, live? You, are you yeah, using it live? that's what I use live, yeah. So when you go in like front of house, you just bring the Kemper, you got your... your, your they, uh, they go direct with the out of the Kemper, and, mm -hmm. and they mic it too, um, so it's both. Have you profiled stuff with it, or are you using profiles never, from other people? I just used what was in there, and I tweaked it to my own. I think yeah. I used the Van Halen uh, amps, Yeah. and I kind of tweaked it to my own sound and I mean you can't beat them you know? that's what I do I tweak this sound so good right you know? I use what what's in in my stuff you know I use fractal stuff but yeah. same concept right and uh, tweak and find find your sound but it's yeah I mean you tremendous. can profile the, the profiling is amazing if you use that I've seen people profile uh, some of the new Eddie Van Halen amps and yeah. they, you know sound exact and the thing is, the modeling has come a long way. It's not like it, it's really come a long it way. It sure has, right. You know, um, I started with the Line 6 stuff, with the pod. And a lot of people didn't know how to use the pod correctly, you know. And when I went from the camp, from the pod to the camper, we ate and beat it. And I, that, that, you know, even the sound man said, you know, that it's not that big. It's not that big a difference. It's, a, it's the camper's definitely a better sound, but... That was close, because I was using sort of a Saldano sound, too. Yeah. Um, I think I mixed a couple of Saldano and Eddie Van Halen amps uh, on different things, but I do know I found something that I, that I could work with, and then I just kind of tweaked it to, right. to what I like. And uh, it was live. It was like, it was great because, you know, that I had that sound no matter what, because I was only, at that time, I wasn't even using the, because a lot of times I had to use the with the with the pod I was using the using as a preamp and go, just using the power section of the Marshalls. Yeah. But with the Kemper, it had its own power, and then I had these other two power amps. Uh, I can't a quilter. Do you know the quilter power amps? Two hundred watts each to power the other two cabinets. So those. So the Kemper was doing everything. I had my own two power amps. So I didn't have the marshes were just there for looks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't right. even using it. I was using the cabinets. But it was great because now it was consistent. You know, before when I was using the, sometimes using the power of the marshals, the power section, sometimes they needed tubes or they weren't quite right. So it, sometimes it just didn't sound right. Mm -hmm. You know, but when I, uh, when I just had the camper and the separate power amps, I had the same consistency no matter where we played. Unless the speakers were bad, but most right. most of the cabinets had good speakers. My only issue I have with technology isn't really an issue with the technology. <clears throat> My issue is you can get too wrapped up in the tech and less on the playing. Back, back, you know, we're kind of old school rockers, and not that long. Technology, this technology has been around for a while, but not a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. You would get a sound in the studio and you'd go with it. Right. It was good. And you went with it and you just tweaked the EQ a little bit. And I'm kind of I'm kind of like that with technology. I don't want to get too wrapped up in shaping the tone. Because you can spend hours oh, yeah. and days and you can go down a rabbit hole that you can't get out of. And then you don't feel like recording. I got to record it. I get the tone. I want a tone that's accessible, that makes me want to play, that fits the part, I'm good with it. Are, yeah. you, are you like that? Yeah, I got, like, the, what I have in the camper now, I haven't even updated it, like the firmware or anything. Yeah. Because I'm happy with the way it sounds. Yeah. You know, I did spend hours, yeah. you know, tweaking, you know, what I did. True. And I did that for both of us, you know, on, on JJ's amps, on his camper. So... I mean, I used his guitar, but basically it's very similar to the way yeah. I, what I did with mine. But, you know, I spent hours to 
I spent a lot of time. Same, same thing with the pod. I spent a lot of time getting it to sound the way it did. Yeah. And a lot of people even said to me, I never heard a pod sound like that. <laughs> you know? And a lot of times people kept using it. They forgot to turn off the, the cab sim. Yeah. And then it gets oversaturated. Yeah, right. And that was a big mistake that a lot of people didn't know how to use the You're exactly the right. You don't you, know, you gotta turn that off and yeah. I find you gotta you if gotta tweak the cab, back, you gotta turn that off. Yeah. You gotta tweak back a lot of the treble, boost a little bit of the mids. You know, a lot of people set things too high end and, and you or, gotta or get they scoop it a lot. Too much scoop, scoop right, yeah. right. Guitar's gotta rest right in the middle. Yeah, at my tone uh, live um, old school kind of like Zeppelin and Eddie style where you got your gain turned up and you just turn your volume roll your volume back and there's your sound yeah. do you kind of start is that a, a starting point for you when you develop tones where it's got to be kind of simplistic and universal and then uh, and then you go from there as a platform is it are they I think you know like I said I start with a basic I hear a good what's a find a good sound yeah amp uh, with, with the camper I say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build on this. Yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll listen to a bunch of different amps. Then the one I like the best, I start tweaking that, and that's that's you know. So it's kind of simple. Once I got it, I'm like, I'm yeah. happy. That's it. I don't keep changing it. And obviously, if there's a song. Say there's an intro that's got to have a lot of chorus or something clean. You develop those sounds around a particular I got song. A perfect clean sound too. Yeah. yeah right. You gotta have. It's yeah. kind of like a toolbox. You got to have your essential tools and maybe right. a couple specialty things. Right. And that's it. And 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 then you can emote and put forth your best performance and, and not worry about it. Right? Exactly. And then if you know for a strap, obviously you got to have a little more gain and stuff. So I have sure. a whole different set of banks for from using a single coil. That's a good idea. I need to do that with my fractal. But you can't use the same yeah. humbucker sound that you use on a strap. Right. So cause this way, when you switch, it's People can't really tell the difference, you know. Because a lot of times I'll switch to a strap, and they say like, "How did you get the strap to sound like a humbucker?" And it's well, you know, you gotta just tweak it differently. You can't have this. To me, I never could use the same sound on a strap or a single coil that I could use on a on a humbucking pickup. Right. Because you know, the humbucker doesn't need as much gain. You know, those old Plexi amps are like that. The channel one's real bright and channel two's real dark. And you can plug, it's almost like they designed those amps for strats and Les Pauls. That's what I feel like. That's Single coils point, yeah. or humbuckers. Yeah. Cause, and then you can, you can uh, buy amp them, or not buy amp, but you know, jump, put the jumpers in it and blend it. Right, right. Um, and get the right tone. Yeah, but, I don't know. It's like, once you have a good sound, that's what I like about the campers is very consistent, you know. It's like it's, and you know, the, the thing about the tubes are great. They have a great warm, but you know, they need a lot more maintenance than than the uh, that's true. To say stuff. That's true. You know? That's true. And when it first started happening, I guess you know, the solid state did sound kind of cold, but it's really come a long, long way now. I know. Uh, and, you know, it's, so it's like circuit boards now. This. You know all this talk so. about <laughs> all this talk about equipment, man. Makes me let's let's take a look at your guitars. Okay. Let's let's quit. You know, mm -hmm. I could go on for hours, but yeah. we'll we'll do a part two at some point. But yeah. you guys, first of all, this is this is Eddie's album. I'm gonna I'll put a screenshot of this on also so you can see it. This is on uh, Spotify. It's on it's so on Spotify. Apple Music. I was listening to it last night. CD. Axes to axes. Yeah. CD baby. CD baby. Check it out. Check it out and uh, you can download it. I really and Apple Music it's up there too. It's on Apple, yeah. I yeah. listened to it last night. I, I man, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and let me geek out and ask you all these questions, and uh, bringing your guitar. So let's let's take a look at these guitars, sure. and then let's do a little bit of jamming, okay? All right, cool, Sounds man. Good.